Welcome back, everyone, to the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. This is Dan Giffen. Today, I'm hanging out with Greg Debicki. He produces under the name Wolg, and he's based in Montreal, Canada. He's an artist, producer, live performer, programmer, audio-visual manipulator. Greg studied fine arts in Alberta and music composition in the United Kingdom. He has set out to design generative software, custom hacks, and interactive projections, which has pushed his art pretty far. He does some really interesting things. He's performed all over the world and creates a lot of really cool Macs for Live devices that you might check out. And also developed a specific Max for Live device for Mr. Bill, which we had on the podcast back in the day. Greg has collaborated with artists like Tipper and Friends, Mr. Bill, many others. And today we talk about a lot of interesting things. Like we talk about his process for programming AI to play cello instruments. He talks about his process for running visuals synced to the music that he's performing. We talk about the play culture and DJing versus performing with instruments. He talks about his approach to sound design, how he feels about the genre IDM, which is hilarious. And we have a good chat about a lot of different things. So make sure you listen all the way through to the end. Before we dive in, just want to let you know, if you're looking to purchase the latest version of Ableton Live and you want a hookup, go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton. You can read more details there, save some money. Also, if you want to be the first to get new episodes, go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. Join my newsletter. I'll try not to spam you or send you junk and send you some free Ableton Live devices, some training, and you'll be the first to know when new podcast episodes come out. That's pretty much it. Let's jump straight into this episode with Greg, aka Wolg, and hope you guys enjoy. He was an awesome guy, and make sure you give him a follow. We have a pretty cool um, experimental scene over here. Um, for like experimental music and people building their own instruments sort of thing, like not acoustic instruments, but like weird electronic stuff. Okay. There's quite a few like really cool artists come that came out of, um, university of Montreal that are just doing like crazy, crazy shit. Yeah. All the people I know in Montreal are music producers and Ableton users, and they're all just like super nerds. So I, I'm like, in my head, I see Montreal as like this kind of like electronic kind of underground scene that's just like isolated from like pretty much everything else in the country. But yeah, it yeah. also has like a tight hub of, of a community of music producers. So mm. yeah, I don't know. Have you been to an Ableton user group in Montreal? I No, I haven't ever done that. I was doing, it's funny, actually, right before the pandemic started, I started doing these like... um sort of producer hangout things. And we would go basically each week, we'd pick a different person's studio and we'd go over there drink a couple, drink some drinks and, and uh, just like do kind of track review, like, like listen to each other's tracks and, and give feedback and talk about techniques and stuff. It was really fun. But then as soon as the pandemic started, I was like, well, I guess I'm not doing that for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely not. It wasn't the same. Yeah, we tried to we tried to do some like online user groups after doing a bunch of in in person ones because I managed the user group for Indianapolis for now. And uh it just wasn't the same. We tried to do like a track sharing event online where you'd swap files and we'd all listen together. And I heard a really good analogy by um Jim Gaffigan, the comedian. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know him. He talked about like how the pandemic for creatives was like dry humping. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's not, amazing. It's not the same thing. Like you're still getting some result, but it's just not quite. The same. <laughs> That's beautiful. I thought it was really true though. I was like, yeah, it kind of is. Really. Yeah. 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 It's really He's got a lot of nice little He's hilarious. I love yeah. him. He was on like the Joe Rogan podcast recently, which I don't always listen to, but I listened to that one. It was good. Nice. Anyway, back to this podcast. Yeah, you were we were talking about before we were doing some audio stuff a second ago about your involvement with this new project. Uh, can you share a little bit about it for people who don't know? I mean, I thought it was really cool doing some AI work with cellos specifically. Right. Yeah, so I'm collaborating with uh, David Gardner, who's who goes uh, makes most of his kind of music projects are under the name uh, Montreal Life Support, uh, and so we made this, we decided to make this thing where he built some robots that are able to play the cello. Uh, and I wrote some AI to, to write, to make some music for those cellos. Yeah. Uh, and we have three of them and 
yeah, it's been a really interesting road of, of kind of trying to figure out how this thing is going to work. And like, you know, we were talking before about the, the mechanical noise of the motors and the, all the different weird noises that come through and how it's like, it's interesting because it's, you would, you would imagine that, yeah, or for example, on the AI side, you could, you would imagine that you could like train an AI on a bunch of cello music and then just send that to the cellos. But since they play so differently and yeah. they sound so differently than, than uh, a regular cello, we kind of had to do a bunch of it from scratch and just figure out what are the cool sounds that this thing can make and treat it sort of as a new instrument instead of thinking of it as a cello. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's so wild to me because like, it's not like playing a drum, right? Like training AI to hit a drum, I feel like would be so much easier. Playing the cello just in its own nature is freaking hard, man. Like there's yeah. so many, so many variables. You don't have frets, first of all, really. I mean, yeah. you're kind of gliding up and down the neck and then trying to train a bot to do that for you. Like, <laughs> like that sounds, that sounds tough. But that was yeah, that, that was part of the fun is that like, so at, at the beginning, we were like, oh, we could just tune all the notes. And then we have, I, I wrote this, like, I figured out this kind of like vague equation for like where the, the notes should be on the fretboard. And it like, you can't like, you can't trust it because it's also like the intonation and like the tuning changes if you press too hard and, or you bow harder, then the note gets slightly sharp. And yeah. So there's all this stuff. So we ended up having to just go through and tune each note and just load that into, uh, like I loaded that into like a dictionary and then it does like a lookup process to find <laughs> where the note is. How long did it take you? Like, uh, just It's just countless fucking hours of, like not this one particular thing, that one particular thing was like, once we figured out that we had to tune each note individually, it was like, you know, I don't know, an hour or two of that. And then writing the, writing the program to like make it work that way. But we just went through so many iterations of like different things. The other thing that's interesting about this is like, so we send it like we, uh, like the AI outputs MIDI basically. And then the MIDI gets sent from Ableton to the cello. Okay. But normal instruments, you can play any two notes, right? But these ones, you can't play two notes on the same string. So we had to figure out this like little, <laughs> to write this patch that's like prioritizing which notes. So for example, the notes that are lower on the fretboard sound better. So you have to search for like the first available string that is, the, and, the, and the lower strings also sound better. So the lowest string that's available the, and the lowest on the fretboard. So check if that string also has another note that's being played maybe higher up. And then you have to like play lower on the fretboard. And there's all this like little yeah, yeah, yeah. And the checking this sort of like hierarchy of like, what's the best place to play the note. And then once you find that position, it's like, how hard does it press on the actual string itself? Yeah, or exactly. it too much? Dude, that's insane. So do you play cello? Like, how did you get this idea? Like, how did this start? Well, so when I was on tour with the, um, that interpolate project that I did, which was like a full dome projection surround sound sort of thing um, that I toured a bunch a couple of years ago. Um, uh, David was on that same tour uh, with one of his projects and we were just sitting at the pub this one night. I think it was when we were, we had a stop, we had kind of a longer stop in Berlin. So we were sitting around in the pub in Berlin and just chatting. And it turned out that we both had this same idea of like a robot that plays an instrument and then we started started talking about it and we sort of noticed like because he's more on the mechanical side he's the reason that he never did the project by himself is because he's not as strong on the programming side yeah and i'm stronger on the programming side but i don't know that much about the mechanical stuff so it just it, it was just like we were like oh shit i guess we have to do this project together <laughs> <Because> <laughs> like, perfect relationship there yeah, yeah exactly yeah so it's, yeah, it's been really interesting. And he's like one of the hardest working motherfuckers I think I've ever met in my life. Like that dude, that dude goes hard. <laughs> well, I think if you're going to be doing some like new AI stuff with mechanics, you kind of have to be pretty hardcore as far as like just work ethic and going deep into that rabbit hole. Mm -mm. Yeah, that was an interesting journey for me too, because like I'd done a fair bit of generative music. I, you yeah. know, um, 
I'd done a lot of, you know, making generative max stuff. And, but then when I came at this, I, you know, recently we've had this whole kind of, uh, renaissance of AI stuff with the neural networks and everything. And so I was like, oh, I really want to get into this, the, the new stuff, the neural, well, neural networks aren't new, but this new kind of generation of neural nets. And, uh, and so I started researching, I did a couple of courses like through Google and then some other course, I can't remember. And then uh, I didn't realize the magnitude of the undertaking that I was trying to do and just trying to like cram through it. I bet. And yeah, I kind of toasted my brain a little bit. So we ended up doing this thing where, because we wanted it to write music. We didn't want it to write just like regular classical music for two reasons. Like one is like, these things are just really different. I think I said that already, but these things are just really different from from uh, a normal cello. Like it plays really differently and there's different sounds that are cool that come out of it that a normal cello player couldn't or wouldn't do, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we can kind of talk about that later. But anyway, so so we wanted it to write music in our style. So the first thing that I did was I wrote this tool for making writing interesting chord progressions faster. So I wrote a couple of these Max tools to make our life easier. And then we wrote a whole database of like chord progressions, which was also brutal of like just sit down and crank out as many like Cool yeah. chord progressions and you lose focus so fast like it's like you know you write like it's like you know usually when you sit down to write music you like write and you're like working on you're trying to get one cool song right yeah. in one session or whatever yeah and or two maybe you know you have a good day maybe you can crank out three cool songs or something but it all f- starts to feel so meaningless when you get into the like 50 cool chord progressions in a day sort of range. <laughs> like, yeah. we're just, just trying to crank them out and you, and then trying to listen to them and pick out which ones are cool is also hard because like you have to give your brain like a palate cleanser after a while because they all start to just sound the same. And you're like, this one's fine, I guess, or oh, oh, this one sure. sucks. And now they all suck. And now I hate, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's just really confusing. So yeah, that so was a fun process. So that's wild. You basically had to like write down every chord progression that's possible on that machine and then start programming. Did you do all this programming in Max MSP, I assume? And then are you for the live shows? Are you running that like as a Max for live device in Ableton? Or are you just running it straight out of Max? Yeah, there's the process is split in a bunch of different ways. So a lot of the neural net stuff I just did in Python because it's like it's a, a lot easier to get into. Yeah. And um, so what I would do is like I train the thing and then maybe fine tune it a little bit. And then I would export a bunch of chord progressions. And then in Python. Yeah. And yeah. then load those all into Ableton and just kind of like pick which ones were cool. And then on top of that, then I was like, OK, well, maybe it would be cool to have something that writes an interesting melody over top of it because just chord progressions get pretty boring after a while too right so i wrote another sort of like more classical ai like uh i can't remember what technique i ended up using but like the, in that realm of like i don't know 20 30 years ago or whatever of like markov chains and that kind of that type of ai generative stuff i don't i guess we don't really call that ai anymore but and then that thing so like that thing checks what notes are playing and then picks from a sort of a short list of like what notes would sound good over top of that and then picks out a rhythm and Mm -hmm. and it's like a bunch of different tools together but then when we play the shows right what we want to get to at some point is that we sort of like press play and it like improvises a whole set but we're not there yet this is why it's like a super we've been working on it for three four years now or something now and we're probably going to be working on it for a long time still but yeah right now it's like we kind of we pick out the best parts and and kind of arrange them into a set and then that's that's how it plays yeah no it's it looks really interesting i would love to come to one of the live sets that you do sometime if you ever decide to do it in the u.s definitely let me know and i'll share it because i'd love to see it um yeah it also looks like you had a, a visual component as well i saw you had like i think it was like two or three cellos set up with the like ai robots or whatever playing them and then you also had some lights surrounding that were kind of synced up to the music as well Mm -hmm. And you kind of got your background in with the whole visual art thing first, right? Wasn't, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think I saw you using touch designer or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've used a bunch of those kind of programming things for 
for visuals. Like I did my first tour, the like ring buffer thing. I did that all in processing and then I did some more shows in processing. And then I did some with jitter in, in max MSP. And then finally I found touch designer and I was like, Oh, well, this is way easier than <laughs> what I was doing before. You can just do so much more in touch. Design. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. And then it's sort of like, I'm learning a little bit about writing, uh, GLSL and and just trying to kind of streamline that a bit too because this big part of my creative process is also like dealing with not the best computers let's say oh, yeah. so there's like a there's really always like a max for CPU and a max for for a GPU right especially if you want to run a show and you want to have like a relatively portable setup it's like and you have a certain amount of money right like it's like there's like kind of a max that you can max amount of juice that you can get out of a computer and that's why I'm kind of going more towards the GLSL stuff because it's all like it's just on this the GPU and that frees up the whole CPU for playing the music because all the music stuff is on the CPU. Yeah. So then you kind of can almost do like I'm almost at the point where you can kind of do both on the same computer. Yeah. For Tipper and Friends I did both up the same computer and then oh, last Christmas cool. I didn't last Christmas that. Yeah, last Christmas that computer exploded though. So I was trying to run some like AI thing while on a Zoom call while doing something else. And it yeah. and it just like it wasn't an optimized script. So it took it. I I don't know exactly what happened, to be honest, but that wasn't during it. It stopped show. working. No, what? no, no, no. Oh, okay, no. that would have been sad. Yeah. That'd, yeah. <laughs> that'd have been, yeah, definitely had that happen to me before. It's not fun. <laughs> it sucks. Yeah. Just use your GPU to mine crypto and save it and then use it. <laughs> and then use that money to buy a new computer or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, that's really cool. So as far as your setup now with your lighting, I'd be curious, what is your process as far as running the audio in sync with the, the video? Um, I've done it a bunch of different ways. So like, yeah, so and, and my shows kind of sometimes I do visuals, sometimes I do lights, like I built these, um, this kind of pretty basic lighting setup where I have a bunch of these analog LED s strips and then they're all hooked into this uh, uh, little microcontroller board that I made and um, and so but most of the time the way that I sync between programs is like I'll send usually I'll send MIDI out of Ableton and then if that needs to go to another computer then I'll have a separate max patch running that turns it into OSC to send to the other computer yeah. Because I have had in the past issues with like Ableton prioritizes sound. So if you get close to your sort of max CPU and by close, I mean like 50%, it starts, it starts just dropping, uh, OSC messages, which sucks because <laughs> then your shit's not in sync. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, so if you send MIDI out of Ableton into like a virtual MIDI cable or whatever, and then you turn that into OSC, then you can send it over a network cable or whatever. Um, or sometimes other programs you can just send MIDI to, like, for example, touch, I think you can just send MIDI directly. Um, and the, the lighting thing that I made, I, it shows up as like, a the microcontroller shows up as a MIDI device, so I can just send MIDI to it directly. And yeah. then, so anyway, so then the way that I sync it is like, sometimes like for some sections, I'll have pre-made, um, lights that sync up to the music, uh, and so that's more of the sort of like perceptual elements of the music. And then I'll have some bits where it's like analyzing uh, the sound and doing some thing based on the, the, the sort of like the actual analysis of the sound. So we could have like, you know, volume could be controlling, I don't know, the brightness or whatever, or you can have the spectrum and different parts of the spectrum show up on different lights, or you can have all sorts of shit. And, um, so there's sometimes I'll do that. And then sometimes I'll have um, uh, something that's linked more to the controller, right? So if I'm control, if I have a MIDI controller or whatever that I'm using to uh, control the sound, then those same parameter changes will change something about the, the, the lights or the visual output. Mm. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I did with Resolume. And nice. I, I yeah, have, yeah. I, I'm not a Resolume expert by any experience. I'm a complete idiot when it comes to like doing crazy stuff with Resolume. But I know enough to basically where I synced it up with like an OSC sender 
and I map, mapped it to my ABC 40 and it was a lot of fun. But I also was like, I don't want to have to carry more shit to a show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so but more power to you, man. Like, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, yeah. I feel like there's this threshold of like, of like, it's cool. It's, it's like cooler, cooler, cooler. And then it's like too much, too much stuff. <laughs> I don't, I'm not carrying all that. And, you know, the, it's funny because I'm such like a minimalist. Like I'm so aggressively minimalist about that stuff. Like for the longest time, I was playing just with my my MacBook and I had written this this Max patch so that I could use the keyboard and the trackpad um, as my MIDI controllers. And then I had a bunch of like sort of macro keys. I had a bunch of different modes that I could kind of switch into. So I had some really good control. That's cool. I mean, I still use that. But, uh, you know, and, and now I'm doing this fucking cello project where it's like, OK, what are we going to ship these like these huge things? <laughs> like, <laughs> That's so it's funny. Like, Dude, I I relate to that so much. I was like, no, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna scale down, and then next thing I know, like a year later, I'm carrying like five more things, and then it's just <laughs> yeah. like it's just like always iterating and like like refining, and then just it just is never it's always changing for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's funny. Well, it makes it fun. It may, you know it makes it fun to, to you're always we're always kind of like finding new ways to to perform. I think that's kind of a fun thing about about playing the computer as your instrument instead of instead of playing like a regular instrument like those regular you know it's like if i played guitar maybe i'd have some different guitars but they'd all be guitars right yeah. but with the computer it's like oh am i going to control it with knobs or am i going to control it with like some i don't know a joystick or am i yeah. going to control it with like a eeg headset or something or like yeah there's lots of different ways to interact with it mew, mew, mew gloves or whatever <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs> No, and I think it it is kind of the wow factor, like when you go to a show and the DJ is holding something that's creating sound, like it's, mm-hmm. it, for whatever reason, like I think, and maybe this is me just being like pessimistic, but I think like the DJ culture has gotten kind of lazy in some ways where it's like, you know, it's cool. Like there's a lot of, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of talented DJs out there. Like DJing mm-hmm. is its own art form. And I have tons of respect for a lot of DJs. I really do. But um, there's there's a lot of play culture where you just hit play and it's, yeah. just, it's just going. But, you know, if I see somebody even holding a guitar or just actually interacting with it, and then that's the other part of it, too, is like, you know, if you're playing a big festival or something, like probably 80 percent of the people out there have no idea what you're actually doing in the first place. Yeah. You know, yeah, what I mean? do they really care? Does it really matter? Like, that's a whole nother conversation. That's Yeah, I really like that question because I think part of it is. I like, I like to think about like sort of the smoke and mirrors of it. So, and you can play with that when you're on stage. So, so sometimes what I'll do is like, what the way I think about it is that you're actually my friend, Martin, um, we were, we were talking about this, about like, what is it, what does it sort of mean to perform? What is, what is the, what is your job as a performer basically? Yeah. And mm-hmm. his, he had this thought of like, you know, your music is this like alien world that you live in and you're sort of like transcribing these messages from your alien world. And then when you come to perform, it's like you've arrived from your alien planet and you are telling the stories or whatever from your alien planet. But it's not that easy to understand what the stories are. So you have to sort of like act it out to like really give the impression of like what is happening in the story. Yeah. So I, re- I really like that idea of like being an alien trying to like <laughs> explain yeah. the stories from your your weird bedroom producer <laughs> island or whatever yeah yeah no i totally hear that that makes a lot of sense and i think part of it is just like the energy that you're giving off stage mm-hmm. if people can actually see you like that yeah. first of all makes a huge difference but you know unless you're using like a video wall at a huge you know festival if there right, are right. cameras up but like the energy you really put out there i mean people really feel that whether it's your facial expression, I feel like whether it's like what you're actually playing, whatever mm-hmm. that, like people feel that live energy for sure. And yeah, for sure. And there's a lot of performers who are entertainers. A lot of the best performers are entertainers, really, because mm-hmm. they're getting in it. Yeah. 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 I think I think about that sometimes because I like the way that I often have my live setup is like I, I always like to make it so that there's sort of this a, a, a large range of like I can totally change the sound completely 
if, if, for example, if a situation necessitates, like, you know, say I'm playing a thing and I'm like, and in my head, I had laid it out that like, I was going to go into an ambient section, but everybody's trying to dance, you know? So it's like, okay, now I have to be able to turn this into, turn this into a dancey section without changing the story that I'm trying to tell. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. so I have all these different ways of doing that, but I also like to make it so that if I get too drunk or whatever, that it's still going to sound, it's still going to sound good. You know, like there, I can still sort of like ease off the controls if I know I'm like, okay, I'm uh, the last couple things I did really started to screw it up. Okay. I can ease off a little bit. And it's still going to yeah. sound fine. Right. And then, but there's also these sections where it's like, I want this bit to play exactly like I made it. So I don't want, I don't want to take control over it because I'll, I don't have the same precision that the computer does. Right. So sometimes what I'll do is just like, okay, I'm going to move to a section of my MIDI controller that I specifically didn't map to anything and grab one of those knobs and just really like act it out. for that, <laughs> that bit, You know, and, but I think, to me, that that makes a lot of sense because it's not it's it's important to have stuff that's like fun for you when you're on stage. Right. Because otherwise you get bored. It's like it's not yeah. fun to play the show. Right. It's also it's nice for the audience so they can see you turn something, something happens. Right. You're just this bobblehead. If you're not touching anything, you're just kind of. No. Right. Exactly. You're just there. You're drinking, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. It's part of making that connection with the audience. But I think it's also, there is like an element of smoke and mirrors to it. Like I saw this beautiful show a couple of years ago. This guy made this, this thing. Um, I won't get too into the details because I'm not sure if I was supposed to know this aspect of it, but it's this fucking amazing like live performance show where this guy's like taking these light up cables and plugging them in. And it's like making these incredible sounds. And he's, he's moving around the stage, like plugging and unplugging stuff. And, and the whole music is made out of that. It's like past modular sense or like just random. It's like he built this whole instrument thing, these two kind of like walls and they're connected with all these cables and a lot of work to it's, move. He's yeah. He, he's <laughs> that dude has done the, some of the craziest shit. I, I, I've seen him and this other guy uh, from Montreal or just whatever. I'll shut them out later. But yeah. Um, so I, I remember watching this show and just being like, this is fucking incredible and watching it really carefully and being like, how, how is he doing this? Like, this is yeah. so wild. And I can kind of imagine in my head how you might do this sort of thing, right? So some so sounds were like, as soon as he plugs it in, it turns on, or it's like, you know, he plugs it in, the sound starts, and then he plugs the other end and blah, 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 right? So I'm kind of imagining in my head how you would do this. And the yeah. cables like light up and stuff. Like, it was just an incredible show. Mm -hmm. And and or I was talking to him or his friend after or something, and I was like, how did you do that? That's so amazing. And he's like, Oh, dude, it's just a choreographed dance. Like, the, <laughs> it doesn't do anything. <laughs> you know, while you're like spending an hour just trying to figure yeah, out. Yeah, just trying to decode it. But right. that didn't change the fact that it's like a fucking amazing show. Like, you're watching yeah. it and you're just yeah. like, holy shit, this is so next level. And and he has the chops to like the show that he did after that was like with all these like springs and shit. And that one was was with a bunch of sensors like like uh, uh, I think they're just like weight sensors so like the more he pulls on the springs and they have like uh contact mics in them as well so the more he's pulling yeah. on them the more it's like fucking up the sound and they make their own sound and stuff and he's doing this crazy action of like grabbing these things and like yanking them it's this big metal frame that he like attaches them to yeah. Man, but anyways yeah so it just made me really think about like the smoke and mirrors is a creative potential it's not something to be like disappointed by if you go see an artist I mean, it is disappointing when you go see an artist and then they're doing something and it's like, that thing's not plugged in. It's like, <laughs> the suspension of disbelief is not there, right? Like, yeah. you, you, it has to be believable, right? Yeah. So true. that obviously sucks, right? And it sucks when you go see someone and they just press play and then they're just dancing around up there because you, you, it's lacking that connection. But I think there's space for this kind of like, uh, yeah, to really kind of be an entertainer and, and to... Yeah you know, get into the, the act of it. Yeah. I think, I think it definitely encourages people to like participate or become more engaged by far. Yeah. I think when you have that component too, for sure, it, it makes you unique, you know, um, like glitch Bob is a, is a great example of like people who are entertainers and great like producers and performers, Yeah, and, like all of the above with their, uh, 
I think it's called like the mob meta instrument or something. I forget exactly what they call it. I think they have like MIDI sensors on them, but they're like giant drums and they just like smell it again. And it just creates like all these different sounds. And they have like this giant lemur pad. It's like an XY pad. They just like rub their hands across. It creates crazy (laughs) sounds, you know, but they've got a whole team, you know, it'd be nice if if you and I had like, you know, 10 people that were just like, all right, dude, what do you want to do? Just throw it at us and just come up with crazy shit. (laughs) That's the dream. For sure, for sure. Yeah, some of my favorite TikTok videos are people who are like DJing on their stoves. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah same. I love that. <laughs> They're the best videos. They're like, yeah, dude. It's like real convincing. They're like right on the beat, just scratching, like, <laughs> scratching their their tabletop. Yeah. How did you get into Ableton Live in the first place? Usually, that's the first question I ask on this podcast. But I'd be kind of curious to hear a little more of your story. Oh, good question. Um, so I like I started by using a. Uh, FL Studio, and I was using that for years. You know, I just started kind of dabbling with Ableton. And also, when I started doing shows on the computer, I, I was doing them in Ableton from the beginning. Well, I was like at the very beginning, I was sort of like DJing in Tractor or something. But then as soon as I wanted to kind of like get out of that box, I started doing my shows in, in Ableton. Get out of the box. I think I'm using the wrong expression there. Getting in the box. Yeah. Getting in them. Yeah. yeah the box. So, yeah, I, I just started using Ableton for my live shows. And then the more I got kind of comfortable with it for my live shows, the more I started exploring making music with it. But for a long time, I was really still stuck with, uh, it was really like attached to FL and some of the things that you can do in there. Mm-hmm. And then I started uh, teaching. And when I started teaching, I was sort of like, I was sort of like, oh, I can, sure, I can teach Ableton. Mm-hmm. Like I can, I can teach some beginner sessions in Ableton. It's not, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert, right? <laughs> but I was like, again, I know the stuff. I am sure I can figure it out. Yeah, or you know what a MIDI track is? Like, I really quickly noticed that like, there's just not many people who are looking for lessons in FL Studio, or at least not in my kind of network or whatever. Hmm. So I just started, I was like, screw it. I'm going to switch over to Ableton, just spend all my time working in Ableton. And I, and I was teaching Ableton. And as I was getting better, I was, I was, able to take on more and more advanced students and stuff and yeah and that's kind of like the story of how i fully switched and then that's hilarious I, yeah I, you don't really hear very often that people move to another doll just so they could teach it like yeah. <laughs> like as yeah. a main motivator so that's that's funny yeah i think it was also like the addition of max for live that helped me transition because yeah that makes sense i, I wasn't a big max user but i was like i had been I, I had learned pure data in, in college mm-hmm. and I had been using that like quite a lot. And then, I don't know, I never tried Max, but then when it started coming with Ableton, then I was like, oh, I can't not use this. This is amazing. Like to have a patching environment inside of a DAW is just yeah. it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. And so I, I started getting really into that. And then that really helped to ease the transition because everything that I was missing from, from FL Studio, I could basically just make it myself and add it to, to Ableton. For the most part, there's some things that still yeah, I miss, but whatever. It's really common for a lot of people in IT or at least students that I've taught. A lot of them come from a technical background who just are getting into Ableton. I mean, mm-hmm. it's very, very common just for the way it's set up. A lot of programmers just kind of navigate to it. And it's just, yeah. it's, it's fluent in that area. Yeah, and Cycling74, who creates uh, Max MSP, they, they like, they formed a partnership with Ableton. I forget what it was like 2017 or something. Um, and that was like a perfect marriage, even though they're already doing Max Fly before that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's brilliant partnership move between Ableton and cycling to do that. Cause you know, really, don't, really good idea. Yeah. Not many other dolls are doing any kind of like custom programming integration, you know? Yeah. I wonder if we'll see like some other, Imagine like Pro Tools like picks up C sound or something. <laughs> like, you know, like some other like uh what's the uh, what's the other one? I don't know. Yeah. It, that would be interesting to see. Like maybe that's the new wave, is like they all start picking up their own. Becoming more open sourced. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I heard um NK, yep. NK? NK, yep. He was like the co-developer of Ableton Live, one of the founding fathers, if you will, of Ableton and uh, he was talking on a live stream not too long ago for the anniversary of Ableton Live 11. He was saying they ended up not making Ableton Live more open sourced and, and closed off a lot of features that are requested 
by users every year that they want to have mm-hmm. because there's like vulnerabilities for hackers. And, yeah. so, and that's like a real thing. I thought that was pretty interesting. Speaking of nerds and programming. <laughs> like that, that reminds me of like a couple of years ago, there was this uh, exploit in the Intel processors about the, uh, what is it called? Branch, branch prediction. There's this bit in your, in the processor that, and I'm going to butcher this because I'm not like That's a cool. security nerd. Everybody can fact check this later. We'll be fine. Right, right. So there was this vulnerability that had something to do with this. This It just kind of captured my imagination because it said it had something to do with this like branch predictor part of the chip where it's sort of like based on your past actions, it's like kind of guessing what you're going to do next and then pre-processing some of the stuff that it's like, this is what I think you're going to do. So when you're programming, you can take advantage of this sort of thing by if you're doing the same you need to do the same process a bunch of times or something, then you like group those all together. I can't remember how it works, but there's like some bunch of ways that you can take advantage of this in programming. And there was some vulnerability in that. And and I was like, oh, how cool would it be if you can get some of this, like if you can get some of this, like kind of predicted bits of, of processing and then use those numbers to like generate music. It's oh, like yeah, totally. what you're, and in my head, I was like imagining it as like, oh, wouldn't it be cool? Cause it's like what your processor is sort of like, imagining no i mean that's like basically machine learning with music right where it's all going Mm. that's all coming for sure like uh predicted behaviors i mean you just basically i i imagine and envision someday you're going to open some vst or something in the doll whatever that looks like maybe you're plugged into the metaverse who knows and you just basically come up with like here's my spotify playlist generate a brand new track for me and i want it to be at 120 bpm and blah 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 and then it just pumps out this beautiful track that like is <laughs> exactly what you would imagine in your head that you would want to create like that's i don't think that's that crazy sweet. far off i think that's coming probably sooner than we think it is i think i think we have a little bit more time to get there than we think but i mean who knows like maybe 30 40 years out if we're going to start to see some of that but but I think it's crazy. I mean, you think about how far we've come just in digital music production in the last decade. That's it's true. It's insanity. Wild. Yeah. yeah. Wild. Yeah, I'm kind of interested where that will go as well. I think there's also a huge opportunity for AI stuff for sound design. Mm-hmm. Like um, some of this stuff. Yeah, for sound design and also there's so many different ways where you could incorporate AI into your workflow. I think that would be really interesting. I mean, it would be great if you could just kind of be like, I'm imagining a song like this, and then it would just like come up with the perfect song for you. But at the same time, I feel like there's on the road to that or whatever, or, or even if we're there, but people still want to want to make music. Right. That's, I think there's, I think there's still loads of opportunities for like where AI could go in your workflow. And actually I saw this advertisement for ad for a app recently that like it's for writing lyrics and it can like stay on topic and give close rhymes and also like r- far away rhymes. And like, it, it looked really awesome, actually. Yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, maybe I'm going to start like writing R&B now. <laughs> oh, I saw something like that. It was like a website that was promoting mm-hmm. auto-generated lyrics. Mm-hmm. I have to go back and search that. But that, yeah, I, I, that's crazy, man. That's just such yeah. a wild thought that you have all this stuff generated for you. And to me, it's like, you know, that's really cool. Like, I would love to play with that. But there's something about just like the development for me, like personally of like having to like beat my head against the wall, trying to figure out something new for the first time. And then like be patient and like working towards a goal of like, okay, now I actually know how to mix this track. Like, you know what I mean? And like all the times where you like were like in your room in a dark cave and you were pissed off because your your song sounds like absolute garbage and then you figure out and you watch tutorials. There's something about that process, I think, that like builds a lot of character. As Absolutely. Far as like yeah. really developing that discipline to get good at something, you know? Like mm-hmm. if everything mm-hmm. is just like automa- automatically given to you, you know? In the yeah, it's like that. Whatever, you know, I don't <laughs> know. It's like that sort of delayed gratification thing, right? Yeah. Like, it, I think we, in general, tend to value things a little bit more if we have to work for them a little bit. Or like, like actually, so this reminds me of this conversation I had with a friend of mine years ago. And we were talking about how, you know, back in the day, you wanted a, you wanted an album, you had to like go to, to HMV or whatever. And then you would like 
listen to it. Maybe you would get to listen to it on their headphones. You kind of suss it out, play a couple tracks and then, yeah. oh, okay, do I want this? And then you buy it and then you have the whole walk home where you like got the CD and you're like looking at the case, like looking at the liner notes or whatever. And you yeah. finally get home and you put it in the blah, blah, blah. Right. And, and how sort of like gratifying that was, you listen to your CD and, and even a kind of, it's, I feel like back in the, I mean, back in those days, I was pretty young, but back in those days, it would even be like, if I bought a CD that I ended up not liking, I still, that for those first couple of days were still magical, right? You're like listening to it for the first time. You're like, ah, yeah. cool. And you're like reading through the lyrics and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we were kind of spitballing about ideas for album launches. And we were like, <laughs> we were like well, we want to give away the, the album for free, like on a USB stick or, what, or whatever. Maybe we can just like email it to you or like there's an email code or something. But we decided to do, we would do like an album launch on the top of like a, a hill. <laughs> so you could get the music for free, but you had to like walk up the hill. So you still get this like delayed gratification, <laughs> like you had to work for it. Yeah, that's when you know, that's when you know who your real fans are. So yeah, you have exactly. to actually work to get to the music, you know, and yeah, yeah, I miss those days. That was great. Yeah, that's true. Like, you know, if you want to listen to this hard, you know, hard work I made, then you're gonna have to come get it. It's yeah, not, yeah. I'm just not, I'm not just gonna throw it down the hill for you. You gotta come. I worked my ass off for this. You gotta, yeah, <laughs> at least climb the hill. God damn it, effort. Yeah, it's got a two way relationship. Yeah, that's that's funny. That's hilarious. Uh, Matt Moldover came up with a really creative idea, kind of off topic, but he he came up with this really interesting concept. He made a like an eight track cassette tape that was actually a USB, but you could mm. you could play it. It had like tiny little speakers on it. It was like an it looked just like an That's eight sick. track tape, and then yeah, and then it had like little speakers. I forget how it worked, but if you like shook it. It would like power and turn on and play, or if you like wow. do it or something. That's I don't remember what awesome. it was, but yeah, it was like you could hear it on these crappy little speakers on the tape itself, but it was a USB that had the files that you could plug in as well. It was really so like, sweet. He made all of them. Like it was crazy. I don't know how long that took him. Dude, Can I wish you... I had that much time. That'd be awesome. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a really beautiful idea. Do you remember the uh uh Tristan Parrich? I think it was called One Bit Symphony or something? I've heard of a, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was like he and he would sell it in this CD case where he's got the little just a really simple chip that he had programmed to just make like one bit music. I ca I remember I he came to my school and I ended up getting a chance to to talk to him and stuff. I I remember him saying cr something crazy about like the way that he wrote it, like line by line of like the instructions on the chip were like on off on off. And so he's like, okay, I want this frequency, so I do on on off off off. And then I duplicate that as many cycles as I want. It was like, it was just, I can't remember what it was exactly, but it was like something fucking ridiculous. There's some and, shit out there, man. Yeah. But then, but the release was like in a clear CD case and it had the chip in there and a little uh, watch battery or something. And then you could plug it into a headphone jack That's and, cool. and just listen like directly off of the chip. That's so, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. That creative stuff. I love, I feel like that really sets artists apart from like, Hey, Absolutely. Give me your, follow me on SoundCloud and I'll release my track to you. You know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, which yeah. Is like still great, but you know, being innovated in that sense. That's so cool. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's, I don't know. I, I feel like I've lost a bit of steam for that lately. I mean, maybe it's, maybe that's just a good indication that I should start working on more stuff like that. But I feel like in this kind of landscape, it gets really confusing of like, it's like, oh, you got to update your, Instagram and you got to oh, post wow. something on your Facebook yep. and you got to put out a message to your fans and the blah, blah, blah. Right. And like, remember to fucking bother them every single day about some crap that you took and how it looks. And like, I consider myself like relatively extroverted, but that shit is like too yeah. much for me. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not out like on that level, you know, there, I actually had this conversation in the previous episode with Amber Steak, um, who is like, legend like i love that guy super nice guy and he's taken a, a sabbatical for music for i think it's been over like a year or two or something and um he's just talking about the whole concept of how like social media makes you dumb and uh it was <laughs> funny and he explained it really well so anybody listening i encourage you to go listen to that as well but yeah we talked about how i mean social media is really just dopamine hits you're like that yeah. like button in the way it was like 
actually crafted and created and strategically built with the algorithms to keep you on platform. That's the whole goal, whatever yeah. it takes to keep you on their platform. And a lot of times it's at our own psychological expense. It's a real thing. And yeah, um, yeah. it's easy to get addicted to that because when you see how many likes, then you're like, oh, I got 42 likes. So this means that like, people love me, you know, and yesterday yeah, I got yeah. 17 or like, you know, and then a year from now you get like 150 and it's like, it's like watching crypto. It's, you can get addicted to that shit. It's for real. Sure, it's sure. just like you're watching it go up and down and then you're like, well, I didn't get as many likes. So people don't like me anymore. Or like maybe this content sucks. Maybe I'm stupid. Maybe I should stop yeah. doing this. Like, it's like, no, you shouldn't stop making music just because you didn't get like 10 more likes than you did last week. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, true, true. It's a real thing, man. A lot of artists struggle with that, and myself included, too. Yeah. You know what? I think that that there's one aspect of that that I think can be useful, and I mean, maybe I'm naive, but I, like I just remember when I was on on like MySpace and SoundCloud. I mean, I'm still my tracks are still on SoundCloud, but I don't like interact with it as much. Like back in the day, that was like a big chunk of my life was just like going and finding new tracks on MySpace or on SoundCloud and commenting on people's shit and and talking to them and and that sort of thing. And but one of the things that I really like that I got out of that was that when you finish a track and you don't show it to anybody, then it, you have this. It, I mean, at least for me, I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm like okay, it's it's cool, but. You know, it's like yeah. as soon as you show it to people and people start interacting and they yeah. like it or they don't like it, that also I find that helps me to sort of like stay motivated it, yes. it, and and it helps me to like know, oh, everybody didn't like this section where I put this like screeching 10K <laughs> side tone or something. Yeah. <laughs> right, maybe I won't do that yeah. next time, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's an amazing place to get feedback for sure. For sure. Like, as an artist and, and that motivation too. That was something that Ambrose and I also talked about is like getting that, that encouragement and having a community, I think is more important now than ever for people because we've all been locked up. And 100%. Shit in yeah, our homes. Yeah. I think social media can be a beautiful thing to have that connection with other people. And I have yeah. to keep forcing and reminding myself, these aren't just like random accounts. Yeah on the other side, these are actually real humans that mm -hmm. I'm interacting with. And then whenever I like, but it, and honestly, like now I actually kind of thrive and think it's hilarious. I have like really sick, twisted humor. When I see somebody <laughs> post a negative comment about me, like yeah. I, I spent so much time making this like video in the woods. I bought a generator that was like $800. I went into the woods. It's like early COVID times, right? Everybody's mm -hmm. locked up. I went in the forest with my band. We all got tested. We went out into the woods. We played this video. It did really well. It went on, it not completely viral, but it, it did really well. And mm -hmm. then there's like one person that posted like on the third day out of all these great comments, it's like talentless. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking God damn it. always said talent in capital letters. And I was like, and I thought it was hilarious. Like I was laughing. I thought it was great. I like, I hearted it. I like put a big heart on it. <laughs> I thought it was great. Like there's, and it made me sad because there's like people who are like shit posting. Mm. Those are usually a lot of the most miserable people out there. And they probably true, yeah. need the most love, to be honest with yeah. you. So, you know, I just kind of see it that way and live my life. It, it reminds me a little bit of that thing of like, of like, you know, when you're younger and you want, and you want attention, then sometimes you do something bad to get attention Oh, right. Yeah. And, and it's like, well, like I got the attention, so I'll just keep doing bad stuff to get, the, you know what I mean? Yeah, and it's like, true. it's, true. it feels like that same cycle. That reminds me a little bit of this. I remember I made that, uh, this, this remix of like a drum and bass song a while ago and I was really proud of it. It was like really glitchy and weird, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And you know, I posted, I got some good comments, yada, yada. And then there's one guy who was like, Oh, you know, if you improve your snares, you could be, you could be actually drum and bass or something like that. And I was like, oh, fuck you. Man. That's awesome. I love it. I thrive on those comments now because it's just, it's hilarious to me. I just, I see it for what it is. I'm just like, no, you're, you're a sad person. And yeah, yeah. funny because I, I guarantee you, I bet money, I would bet you one Bitcoin right now that if, <laughs> that if you went to his profile and you looked at all the music he's made, probably isn't even good or it's probably he probably hasn't even made anything like you, yeah. right. or he's really he's really struggling with snares at the really <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly that's exactly right. yeah. he's like it's all he's thinking about or whatever we right. do this thing on the on the <laughs> so i do this like track feedback every wednesday on on twitch and we do this thing where like if somebody 
criticizes a snare, then we all start writing snare police, like, wee woo, snare police, snare police. (laughs) (laughs) And then we do like, oh, there was this one guy who was like the dedicated or the designated snare police guy. And then so if anybody wanted feedback on their snares and we would be like okay what's the snare police what's the what's the yeah. snare feedback you gotta have a judge yeah it's like the, yeah. <laughs> the head of the squad oh, that's awesome man well you're a great producer first of all um Thanks, man. I appreciate yeah that. i was listening i actually found you from your mr bill collab it's called uh the track was called idm oh god don't remind me <laughs> oh, i think it was uh, yeah so he named it that as a joke. I don't know yeah. if I should be publicly saying, but whatever. I, I got to get this off my back. So he named it IDM Anthem as a joke, I thought. And I was like, ha, that's funny. Yeah, we're going to make the IDM Anthem. And so we're working on the track. And I was like, okay, whatever. This is our working title. We're sending it back and forth. We're working on it, blah, 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 blah. And then he posts it. And I was like, you kept the fucking name IDM Anthem? Like, that's so oh, bad. That's lit. He just posted it without asking you the name of the track. He's like, no, nah, this is it. We're going to do this. I can't, I can't remember. He might have even, like, I can't remember what, that's what the final days of it were. Maybe, I, you know, maybe it was just like, yeah. maybe he did ask and I was like too hungover to care. I was just like, yeah, whatever, man. Post it. Yeah. But, but like, but yeah, fine. I don't know. Every time I see that, I'm like, I'm like, oh man, we made a track called the IDM Anthem. <laughs> it's a great track. I like it. I think it's. I like that I track too. I think it came I think good. it's hot, man. It's a hot track. I think it was one of your more popular ones on Spotify too. Oh, by a lot, by a big margin. Well, that's why it tortures me too, right? It's like made my whole <laughs> my whole musical career. I'm like trying to sort of expand out of this this trap of IDM. I'm trying that's to awesome. like do something different i'm trying to like not you know i mean i leaned on that 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 genre name for a while and and i still think it kind of like matches what i do and stuff but i you know it's like you know and there's all the criticisms of that genre name to idea intelligent dance music like oh we're too smart to like dance normally (laughs) we got to i'm still waiting for there to be an unintelligent dance music like when is when is that going to become mainstream my new album that's what (laughs) yeah you should no man (laughs) awesome I think like, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's funny. And then we make this track together and he names it that. And now my whole, like, Mr. Real is like a million times more popular than me. Right. So any, tr- any collab I was going to do with him, he was going to, he's going to, that's going to be the top of my list or whatever. Right. So now every time I'm like, <laughs> somebody comes to my page, it's like, oh, this is the guy that made the IDM man. Well, that's pretty. That <laughs> I mean, yeah, was a good track, man. It was great. Yeah. Uh, Bill was on the podcast a while ago and, uh, He's he's great. That was a great time. I really enjoyed talking to him. Yeah, he's Bill's cool. a really sweet guy. I really I really like that guy a lot. I love I love him because he's a straight shooter. Like you know, some people don't always say what they're thinking, and I feel like but you always know what he's thinking. He just says, "Yeah, it's it. true." Like, refreshing, really. I love that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and he's not, but he's not like a. I don't find him to be one of those people who's like I'm just brutally honest. Like he's not. He's just no, no, right. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a straight shooter, but he's not gonna. He's, he's not gonna not, be a dick about it or anything. Right. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, you've created a lot of really cool Max for Live devices too, um, including Scratchy, which uh, I downloaded from your Bandcamp. I got a text file, and I might need your help, like. Opening <laughs> <laughs> okay so yeah so now the the, the store has moved over to gumroad by the way yeah. it's gumroad.com slash wolk but but yeah so th- like when i first started selling max devices i was like i tried to upload one to to ben i think now you can just sell uh amxds but back in the day you could yeah. they didn't allow it right wow. so but they did allow text files so you can just rename the file to dot txt and then Bandcamp sees it as a text file, mm. right? So, because it is, I mean, all files are, are you can open any file as a text right. file, right? Yeah. But, um, yeah. so I was doing that for a bit and I don't know if you notice this, but in the description, it tell, it explains like that you just have to rename. <laughs> but the reason I stopped doing it on there and wh- why I moved to Gumroad, a big part of it was because, uh, because yeah, I was just getting these messages all the time of like, oh, I, I just... I, I didn't get the actual file. I just got a text file and I'm like, just, just, just rename it. <laughs> okay. Got See, that's, yeah, that would be good to know for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Gumroad has become kind of the staple for like entrepreneurs and creators just to sell stuff. Sure. 
Yeah, for the max. I've, oh, yeah, for the max devices. Max, there's all yeah. the interesting people. Yeah, for sure. But I think, yeah, I think you know. I, honestly, I, I've the last thing I wanted to say about that is like I don't think that's your fault. I think that's just like it. It wasn't clear. Like it's just not clear. And that was my bad for like trying to work around it <laughs> in my hacky sort of way. I mean, I'm sure I probably could have just <coughs> it, figured it out. Yeah, man. That actually scratchy is also um, because of Mr. Bill as well. Because he wanted, uh, he asked me to make uh, a device for him, a couple devices for him. He wanted to do something really specific with his live sets. And one of the things that he wanted to do is to be able to do turntablism, but using a, a knob and then a button to do the, the kind of crossfader thing. So that's what Scratchy was originally for. But while I was making it, I was like, oh, it's like I like those kind of sounds where where you have the sort of like record going yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know i think that's kind of interesting in its own right and then and the other thing is that that the object that i was using to to make that in in max has like a time stretching mode in there and it has a couple different algorithms for doing the time stretching so in the bottom right of that device there's a little button uh labeled t and there's a little number beside it and it, you know, Bill wasn't using that, right? He was trying to do the the scratching thing, but I couldn't kind of couldn't help myself. So I included that little button for the time stretching. Oh, and you nice. can do these really wicked, like, I actually, I use that thing for sound design almost all the time. Like, oh, totally. I could hear it. I can yeah, hear it. Yeah, yeah. You get to this certain point in your, in, you know, you make your loop or whatever, and then I'll just like resample it, throw it in there, mm-hmm. make a little mud pie of just kind of scratching around in there and then just kind of pull out samples from that and work them back into the loop. And just that, I end up doing that process like recursively on a lot, a lot of tracks. You have to be kind of careful to not overdo it because then you, your whole, because it smears the, when you do that kind of time stretching, a lot of the like phase alignment stuff gets messed up. So you get these really weird phasey artifacts, which are like sometimes cool. But if your whole track is like doused in that, then it, does not sound cool. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a fine line for sure. Mm. Yeah, I played with some of the Mad Zach scratch instruments. He has like a like a scratch macro setup in a drum oh, cool. rack um, with a couple different samples and some scratch racks I played with. But definitely not what you did. You, I mean, you programmed and did some whole next level stuff as far as that goes. So I, I, yeah, it's really cool. Everybody check out your Gumroad for sure. I'll include all the links in the show notes as well so so. check out your devices and your youtube tutorials are hilarious too <laughs> like i was watching that i was at a coffee shop just like laughing out loud the person next to me probably thought i was crazy <laughs> but yeah it was some good stuff i liked um you had one video that i thought was a really good exercise as far as just taking like one sample just like a one shot or a short short mm-hmm. loop and then getting really creative with using audio effects to basically reshape the sound into a kick drum um that was like a really good exercise because i find my i started thinking through i was like i'm probably going to go through and just do this just for fun later uh because like i think i've gotten pretty lazy with my sound design like trying to think like how fast can i get the result that i want that i don't necessarily sit down and just practice making weird shit for the sake of making weird stuff you know Mm -hmm. so i think that was a really cool exercise i think the video is called how to really use effects or something yeah 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 it was on youtube it's my attempt at clickbait. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny that sound. I can't remember how I came up with that idea, but I really like that idea of like you can turn anything into. Some other popular YouTuber did a thing about that, like how to turn one any sound into any other sound, and then yeah. he like vaguely talks about um, additive synthesis, but in like a really roundabout way, and never mentions additive synthesis by name. Yeah. But just this idea of like that you can kind of transform any sound into any other sound. Mm-hmm. And I totally feel you on like the, I mean, I even feel this with my own tracks where I'm sort of like, you know, you're getting ideas and you just want them to kind of come out as fast as possible. Right. And then it's easier to assess if the idea is good or not. Once you've sort of tried it, you can hear it in front of you. Right. Yeah. And I also like highly highly value speed when I'm, when I'm making tracks and, and, uh, and doing sound design and stuff. But that's why I find that that exercise is also really nice because you get these little tricks sort of in the back of your head after doing that, you're, you're like, Oh yeah, I, I forgot that I can do X, Y, Z or whatever. Oh, I forgot that this device 
does do that or like that I can, you know what I mean? It just kind of like refreshes all that stuff. So I really like that exercise. I also found um, with my students, it's so helpful to get them to go through this, this process with me in the, in the lesson, because you can, a lot of the times the hard part about teaching is that it's hard to figure out what the person doesn't know, right? Because yeah. you don't, you don't know what you don't know. So sometimes there's things where it's like, oh, I want to do X, Y, Z, and I can teach them how to do that. No problem. Right. Yeah. But sometimes you're struggling with the track and you don't know what it is that's not working. How, why isn't it fitting into place and stuff? So when we go through this thing, the whole kind of idea with the the challenge is that you have to, you have to remember and know what your kind of the kind of what's happening with the sound, yeah. right? Or like how the signal flow works and how each of what each effect kind of really does and, and how you can use it to shape the sound and blah, 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 blah. And so you can see really quickly, like, oh, there's a misunderstanding about how this effect works. So there's a misunderstanding about how the chains work or how the, how yeah. the, and anything works. Right. So it's like, it's, I've been using it a little bit as this kind of like diagnostic tool. Yeah. And I think it can be helpful for people like that too. If you're really struggling on one part of that video, it might be because you have a misunderstanding about some part of right. how, how it works. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. Like you don't know what you don't know. And um, with sound design, I find personally, it's like a, it's like a dance between the technical knowledge and also just playful creativity and mm -hmm. also like not being afraid to like mess stuff up you know because it's like you know, one, yeah. sometimes people become so like delicate with their tracks where they're just like well i don't want to like the kicks kick sounds okay but i don't want it if i try to make it punch harder then i'm gonna fuck up the whole track and it's like no mm -hmm. it's gonna be okay like you can go in there and just get dirty with it which is i think why idm is so popular because mm -hmm. it has like a unique sound because people are resampling stuff like 42 times <laughs> yeah true yeah yeah i think it's also like i mean with idm we also have this sort of there's this thing of like if you don't if you don't know what you're doing you can just call it experimental music <laughs> <laughs> it's also yeah. yeah right so so right. It, it kind of sucks. I mean, I, I understand where it comes from. And then we also have this other kind of issue where it's like, there's a lot of people in IDM or experimental music who are like, they're against sort of against genres, against genre names and stuff. Yeah. And, and so they're like, Oh no, let it be free. Like it's going to fit into this huge umbrella of experimental music. Yeah. But I think it's kind of sucks, especially now, you know, it's 2022. And when you're trying to find more music, like a certain artist, not having a genre name that that artist vaguely fits into right. makes it a lot harder to yeah. to find you know because it's like it's like oh i'm looking for more stuff like like richard divine and i search for experimental music and then i get fucking floating points and it's like those that's not <laughs> like <laughs> yeah that's, these are totally different totally sounds. different yeah yeah so i think that there's kind of some serious downsides to to yeah, that kind of big umbrella term. But um, oh. I do really like that about IDM that a lot of the time there's space to sort of like do things wrong and wrong, quote unquote, and right. and just like kind of if it's wrong, but it sounds cool, then that's OK. Whereas like I think in a lot of electronic music, it's like if it's wrong, but it sounds cool, then you got to like finesse it so that it's right. And then you try to keep the part that sounds cool about it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. Definitely, man. The whole genre thing is like, what is a genre really to begin with? And um, I, yeah, usually when people ask me like, what genre do you produce? I usually just like list like two artist names. And I'm like, it's kind of mm -hmm. like these two people. Um, mm -hmm. and, then they're, and they're just like, oh, well, and if they don't know them, then I'm like, well, <laughs> it's I guess it's like this. I don't know. Then you whip out your phone and play the drop yeah, of your best. <laughs> yeah, check out the bass on this track on my iPhone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Sick man. <laughs> so how is how is teaching going these days? You're talking about teaching. I love it. I think it's like I, you know, like I was kind of saying before, I sort of fell into it, but it I it's so gratifying to just like work with all sorts of different artists and just see them develop and like yeah and and watch them progress and stuff. Like there's you know, I've had a couple of people now I've been doing it for quite a long time. And I like, I've had a couple of people who have sort of like 
graduated, as in they got so good that I wasn't all that helpful to them anymore. <laughs> right. That's awesome, though. It's, like, yeah, it's amazing. Like, there's this this one dude. I'm keep I'm keep trying to convince him to like put out an an album, but he's he's I mean he's working on it, but. He went from, I think when we first started, he was like kind of making trance music. And then within a year or two, he's making like the craziest hyper glitch I think I've heard in my life. Like it's just so, Big the word. sound design stuff is like so insane and next level. And like, he's really got, Love it. I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, I really, I really like it. And he has his own really kind of particular style that I really like. Man, I'm like just so now, but but now my job in the last little bit, like now he's taking a little break from from lessons, but my job in the last little bit of teaching him was just like almost every lesson I was like, can you please put this on the album? <laughs> like, <laughs> this one's good, and he's like, nah, no, I gotta fix up this. And I'm like, it's good. Like, yeah, it's yeah. okay to finish a song. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, the the whole finishing side is another thing. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. For yeah. But no, teaching is the best, man. Like I've learned so much more since I started teaching. Same. I, I've yeah. had a lot of questions asked that I didn't even know. And I was like, that's good question. I'll get back to you tomorrow. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah. It's, I it's, love that when they challenge you and you're just like, they, they ask you a question. You're like, oh, it's like, no, oh, no, wait, it isn't like that. I'm going to have to look that up. <laughs> and you're like thinking about metaphors while you're in the shower, trying to think, about, <laughs> yeah, how, can yeah, I, exactly. how can I explain this to make sense to the world? <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. That's funny, man. How long have you been teaching for? Well, I got, so I got Ableton certified in January of 2020. Mm -hmm. I probably was teaching about three and a half years before that. Okay. So whatever. Yeah. 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 It's been fun, man. I uh, just recently got hired at a uh, state university called Ball State in uh, Indianapolis. And oh, wicked. Um, so, yeah, that's that was a huge blessing. I'm excited about that. Teach a bunch of college kids. I don't know. When I was in college, like, it was a miracle. I, I didn't fail, to be honest. With you. <laughs> I'm teaching at a state university. I don't know how that works. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers to that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great, great self starter. Story. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm very thankful for that opportunity. So, yeah, that's really awesome. But yeah, I mean, it's all online too, so I can work in my sweatpants or underwear if I need to, and Perfect. that's the American dream, isn't it? I think for like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <work. laughs> but yeah, like I said, Denver is a cool place too, man. and that's that's the plan moving over there. So you should come to come to Denver, man. Play a show. I really want to. Yeah, I really, really want Bring to. Bring the cellos. If anybody, if anybody out there is in denver and is organizing shows oh there are you I should know, book me <laughs> I, I know some people already man we can make that happen nice. we can yeah, definitely make do. that happen 100 percent. i'd love to come down yeah well i know i want to respect your time been hanging out for an hour over an hour and a half which is longer than most episodes so ah, nice it's been a good hang man, for sure thanks man and, uh where's the best place for people to find you or connect with you online uh, good question. Um, I think like, oh, you mean, okay. So for like finding my music and stuff, just like streaming. Yeah. Services. yeah, Just like finding you or connecting with you wherever. Yeah. And if you want to follow like what's going on with me, I guess like Instagram is usually the best place, but Facebook is fine too. Um, I'm also like in the, not in the glitch.cool server that much, but I'm like, I really like that kind of group of, of people. And if you're looking for, you know, a community of people who are into glitch music and, and experimental stuff, then I really recommend looking up. Uh, I think the website is actually glitch.cool. Let me just confirm that. They know dot cool is an actual thing. Yeah. And I guess it is. All right. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, that, that community of people, they have a discord uh, that I think you can join from the, from the site there. It's on the bottom. And so I'm hanging out in there. If you ever want to stop by for a chat or, if you want to join my Discord server, you can uh, subscribe on Patreon. It's only three bucks and you get a lot of free stuff, including an unreleased album Ooh. and the project file for the unreleased album. Which Exclusive. Is kind of fun. Yeah. The VIP. Love it. And all the, I think you get all the Max for Live devices plus some other ones. Plus a bunch of like unreleased techno, three I mean, bucks. Come on. Three How bucks. You say get, no to that? I mean, you've got like a decent amount of devices too, man. That's definitely worth it. Yeah, I might, have to, I might have to jump on that bandwagon. Come on by, come on by. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool, man. Well, Greg, this has been dope. 
Uh, Thanks, man. Yeah, looking forward to hearing more music of yours and um, yeah, releasing some more uh, self-titled IDM. <laughs> 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 no, my next my next collab with Bill is going to be called the Pinnacle of Music Musical Achievement. <laughs> Good name. That's a very proper name. I love that. <laughs> so humble, you know. It is. It is. Yeah, right. We're humble. We're, we're, we're best humble track guys. ever made. <laughs> yeah. So funny, man. I love it. Cool. Well, right. yeah. Everybody, check out the links in the show notes. Listening, and make sure you give uh, Greg, uh, aka Wolg, a follow. Definitely stay in touch, man. I followed you on Instagram today. I'm Philia Music, so. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll follow you back. Give me around. Cool, man. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the podcast. If you don't hate it, then please leave a comment, like, subscribe. Yeah, all of you Spotify people out there, I would appreciate a review. You could just leave a little five stars or something. That would be amazing. Stay tuned for more episodes coming out. If you want to be the first to get new episodes, then join the newsletter. That's where I'll be sending free things and new updates with episodes. So go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter and you can join there. Also, if you're a Discorder, then come hang out on Discord. Go to liveproducersonline.com slash Discord. You can ask me questions, hang out with the Ableton community there, and find some great resources, Max for Live devices, other fun stuff. That's it for this episode. Make sure you give Wolga a follow and I will see you guys next time. Later.